whenever you're ready. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I just want to make sure everybody can hear me. Are we all good? Okay. Um, on behalf of the Illinois State Police, I would like to thank you all for being here today. I'd also like to welcome you to this public forum. Um, your input today is very important to us, and we are looking forward to hearing it. Uh, this hearing is an opportunity for you to present a public comment on the proposed administrative rules relating to the Firearm Dealer License Certification Act, which was approved by the General Assembly and went into effect earlier this year. I read all that out to make sure that you guys are all in the right place. You're where you want to be. Okay, my name is Eva Blaze. I'm employed by the... Right next to me, and he's going to introduce himself to you and tell you a little bit about himself um, in a few minutes. But in the meantime, we're going to go through a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, my job here today is to facilitate this forum. Um, I'm your moderator, so I want to just make sure that we keep everything running smoothly and that everybody gets an opportunity to um, have an opportunity to comment. We want to make sure that um, everyone is able to do it in the time that we provide. And so that means that I'll be the person who's reminding you when your time is up. Um, we have a system for that, and we'll share that with you in a minute. Um, before we get to the speaking part, I would like to just let everybody know that there is an opportunity to provide written comments, and we'd like to encourage you to do that. Um, there have been written comments that were posted um, previously to today, there's sheets in the back where you came in to sign in, and you could add additional written comments. Um, that's not just for people who speak today, that's for anyone who's here. Um, so even if you've spoken and you have more to say and you don't have an opportunity to do that orally, you can always write that down on the written sheets, and we'll collect all of those, and we will review those comments just as we would review them and consider them if you said them out loud. So those are in the back. Again, please take the opportunity to get those um, and include your written comments. If you are going to speak, we want to make sure that you're registered on the sign-in sheet. Um, so if you do intend to speak and you haven't registered on the sign-in sheet, don't worry. We're going to take a little break when we're done with our opening comments to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to do that. Um, in order to make sure that the oral comments match up with the signed up speaker, um, when you came in, you got a number. Um, if you didn't receive that number and you intend to speak, like I said before, we'll take a little break so we can make sure that everybody's squared away and has everything that they need. Because this hearing is being video recorded, um, we're going to ask you to please make sure that you don't speak over other people. Um, when you're a speaker, you'll have an opportunity to go up to the m microphone and talk for your allotted time. Um, please be respectful of the people who are speaking. Um, we want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to be heard. Um, and in the event that we're speaking uh, up here, we would ask that you do the same. We understand that um, all of you took time to come here today, and so obviously this issue is very important to you. Um, and we know that you might have some strong feelings about the issues being raised and the views that are presented. Um, it's an important part of the civic process for everyone who receives a chance to sp speak, that they be heard, um, and that we all be courteous to each other. The rules for the hearing were posted in the front and I'm going to go over those rules now. Um, and there's a few of them, so bear with me. OK, so first off, we're going to be calling numbers five at a time. So one through five will come first. Um, we ask if you're in that group of one through five that you come towards the front. There's plenty of seats up here, so if you don't want to be standing physically in line, you can sit down. Um, second. You are not required to provide your name when you're speaking in the microphone, and we're not going to ask you your name. You're free to provide it if you want to. Um, 
But in order to ensure each person's comments match up with the speaking order, it is um, important that you provide your name and any contact information you desire us to have when you registered. Um, if we later have a question about your comment or would like additional insight, we may want to contact you. Um, providing your contact information is optional, but I'm going to encourage you to do it because, um, as I said, it, it helps us if we have an ability to follow up, if we have any questions or concerns about your comments, or just want to make sure that we can clarify what you've said. Um, okay, this is the important part. Um, everyone has three minutes to speak. And um, several of you, when you came in the door, asked if you were going to be held to those three minutes. Um, and my answer was yes. So we are going to hold you to the three minutes. Um, as you can see, this is not a packed house. So after everyone who has registered has had an opportunity to speak for their three minutes, we'll take a, we'll take a break and we'll regroup and see if there's more time allotted. But in the meantime, um, I'm going to ask that you confine your comments to the three minutes allotted. Um, we are going to remind you of your time. So when you have 30 seconds left, um, there'll be a yellow sheet that's held up. When you see that yellow sheet, that's your reminder that you got 30 seconds to go. Um, when your three minutes are up, we're going to hold up a red sheet, um, which is the indication that it's time to stop. Um, at that time, we'll let you complete your sentence, complete the thought that you're on. But when you see that red sheet, please be mindful of everyone else who wants to speak and wrap up your comments. And um, if you need a little nudge, I will give you one, okay? I said this before, but I'm just gonna um, reiterate it because I think it's important. Um, please be respectful of everyone's views, even if you disagree with those views. Um, based on the written comments that we received so far, people of all views have been very respectful to one another, and we want that to continue here today. Um, in order for this to be efficient, and in order for us all to get as much out of this process as we need to get, um, it's important that we're able to hear from everybody in a respectful and courteous environment. Um, we would really like to avoid any disruptions while people are speaking so we can hear everything that they have to say and more importantly so that it can be recorded so we can go back and we can, we can consider it and rehear it later on. Um, lastly, I want to emphasize that the goal of this hearing is for the Illinois State Police to hear your views on the proposed regulations. If you provide information concerning how these rules affect you, your family, your business, or other people you know, that is important information that can assist the Illinois State Police in making any changes to these rules prior to final review by the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. In that vein, these rules are not finalized. After receiving all the comments today, the Illinois State Police will review these rules in light of your comments and determine if any changes should be made. That is why it is so important for us to hear from you on how these rules affect you. So I read you that whole part and some to say, please be as specific as you possibly can. Give us examples when you're talking to us. Um, as I said before, we value your opinion. We welcome you here today. Um, we wanna hear what you have to say and giving us as much insight with specificity as possible will help us um, do what's required of us on our end, okay? Um, I'm now gonna turn this over to the major so he can explain his part. Hi, thank you again for coming today and spending uh, your time to give us some feedback. My name is Major Jared Ingerbretson. I oversee the Public Safety Services Command within the Division of Administration for the Illinois State Police. Uh, the purpose for today, again, is to discuss the regulations and proposed administrative rules relating to the Firearm Dealer License Certification Act. Uh, the Act, as well as the Illinois Administrative Procedure Act, require and authorize the Illinois State Police to propose regulations to allow its employees to enforce the Act, but just as importantly, to provide the public information and the dealer's information on how they can comply with, with the Act. 
Uh, we recently proposed the draft regulations in an effort to comply with the Act, and the source of those proposed rules were uh, largely from the statutory language of the Act, and then also from related federal, federal regulations or guidance provided by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. I want to emphasize again that these rules are, are not finalized. These are draft rules. Uh, we've received thousands of comments already in written form, and uh, we expect to receive additional comments today. The goal will be to take all those comments back so that we can consider those, review those, and consider whether we need to amend or modify the rules based on those suggestions and that feedback. Uh, at that time, once we finalize the rules on our end, they will go to the Joint Committee on uh, Administrative Rules, or JCAR. And then they will start their process where there's, again, a review and opportunity for comment. We intend to listen to all the feedback that's provided and take, again, that feedback back and look through that and review that so we value your feedback and, again, be as specific as possible as you can with your feedback so that we have all the information possible. And with the three-minute time limit, while we will adhere to that, again, there are forms in the back that you can provide written comments, again, if you need additional time or don't feel like you were able to provide as much specificity as you would have liked to during your verbal comments. So that opportunity will be there for you as well. Again, I emphasize that really the nature and purpose of this is to hear your feedback. So um, it's not meant to necessarily be a question and answer session. It's more meant to be um, information from you on why you know, we should or shouldn't consider your suggestions or your information when we're reviewing these rules. It's not really intended for us to provide you with information of why a rule was proposed. We want to hear about why we shouldn't have that rule or why we shouldn't have parts of that rule based on the information that you provide. Again, be as specific as possible with how it's impacting you, your business, uh, your friends, family, any information that you provide that you feel will help us in our review process. And just as a reminder, once we do take our break, uh, if you haven't registered and still wish to speak, there is, you can register in the back uh, with the officer and uh, young lady in the back to register with them, and they'll give you a number for speaking. And then uh, we'll reconvene and start with the comments and go from there. Thanks again for your time and for coming down. Okay, so um, we're going to take about a five-minute break uh, again. If you have not had an opportunity to register, please go to the back to do that. If you have not had an opportunity to get a number, please make sure that if you intend to speak, you have a number. You can get that in the back as well. And um, also, please make sure that you get the forms for your written comments. Um, again, we, we're really hoping that we can get as many written comments as you guys are willing to give. So um, everything is in the back. Um, we'll take five minutes and we'll reconvene then. Thank you for um, thank you for listening and we'll get going in a few minutes. Okay, hi. I think we're gonna reconvene right now before um, we call the first five speakers up. Just two things I wanted to touch on. Um, one, we got a question during the break is um, whether or not we would be asking qualifying questions or clarifying questions as you were talking, we're gonna try really hard to refrain from doing that unless it's absolutely necessary. It's your three minutes, uh, so we want you to be able to take advantage of all of that. The other uh, thing I wanted to point out is during those three minutes, if you ask direct questions to us, that does count against your time. Uh, as we said before, this really isn't intended to be a question and answer session, and there's a lot of reasons for that, primarily because our ability to answer your questions is probably pretty limited, considering that a lot of people were involved in this decision-making process. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was clear on that. With that, I would ask that numbers one through five come up front. And if number one would just step up to the microphone. Good afternoon. 
My name is Todd Vanderbilt. I'm here representing uh, the Federal Firearm Licensees of Illinois as our trade association for gun dealers in the state of Illinois. Um, three minutes is short to get through a lot of this stuff, but we've tried working with the department from the beginning on this rulemaking. We understand the law was passed and enacted. However, ISP seems to be sending out a lot of conflicting messages. On your website, you offer questions about what definition of retail is. Now in this rulemaking, you've gone back and redefined what a retail operation is. That's significant because certain requirements fall under retail stores and they don't apply to others who aren't necessarily in retail. We think it's unfair that you sit there and, and have a question and answer se session on the web page about signing up to be a cert certified dealer and then you change that in the rules because people who follow your guidance now filed as non-retail and now you're changing the ball on them. And we've consistently asked for a legitimate, reasonable delineation on what retail is or is not. And so far it's as clear as mud. Um, the statute calls for uh, rules in a few places and sometimes it says ISP has the, uh, shall approve this or disapprove that but there's no clear rulemaking authority in there. It, it goes to the safe storage plan. You've gone beyond just approving a storage plan for firearms after hours to going into where now you want a disaster plan. Am I supposed to take into account if the new mattress fault cuts loose or if the zombie apocalypse actually comes about? Because you're going well and beyond to the point you're now telling us that we can't even have ammunition in certain parts of the store. And in some stores in this state, they have sales, and those sales involve pallets of ammunition. And you're sitting there saying, well, you're not supposed to have ammunition somehow accessible, but somebody who seems to have failed to understand, we're in a business where we allow people to walk in with loaded, concealed firearms on their person. We're not worried about that. Somebody seems to have seen one too many movies about what actually happens at the counter of a gun store. Um, and, and again, in some of these things, with the, the backup requirements on the video, you're talking four hours of a backup capability. Again, we believe this goes well and beyond the authority that the state police were given to kind of define or say whether or not the plan is adequate. I know stores that have over 125 cameras in there. You're not requiring a backup system, you're requiring a backup generator. Then we get into the issue of the upload and download speeds of asymmetrical versus symmetrical internet data. That is not available across this state. You're talking of, in a case like that one store of being able to upload 125 high definition Netflix movies simultaneously. If you're not connected to a place directly across from O'Hare, that capability does not, does not exist because it's a symmetrical system. And where they do exist, they're very, very expensive. This whole rulemaking is going to cost a lot. The last thing is, we see nothing here in the rules that allow for out-of-state out dealers to participate. They show up at gun shows. There are out-of-state dealers that come in. How are you going to regulate an FFL who is allowed to transact certain business within the state? Because the biggest one you've got are movie prop houses. And we see nothing in here that allows you to regulate or you'd essentially be shutting off the movie industry in Illinois because they rent machine guns. I will point out to the movie Transformers that was shot in Chicago and all the weapons that were used there. Thank you. We appreciate your comments. Thank you. Number two, please. Belinda Rowe, spokesperson for IllinoisCarry.com. And uh, many FFL dealers paid the $1,500 fee fully expecting to be able to meet the regulations of the law. Now they find that uh, ISP is mandating requirements that are not only not financially feasible, but not even available, like Todd said, across many vast areas of the state with the upload internet uh, data connections. The, uh, they're faced with vague, undefined requirements like facial recognition quality, enhanced lighting, stored separately. These are not defined industry standards. Uh, what might appear to be adequate for one person is not for another, so we need those defined. Rules mandate security cameras 24-7, but does this mean motion activated or continual recording even when no one is present? Dealers are facing not only undefined expensive camera upgrades, but also hugely increased numbers of cameras, not just in and around their shop, but across parking areas as well. Mandated special lighting, night vision to read license plates, which is known to be extremely difficult and unreliable because of the very nature of license plates when they're illuminated and they fluoresce. 
the ISP might not have taken into account the many different types of parking lots. We have street front parking. This will, requ will this require cameras up and down the street, across the street, mounted on other businesses? Does it call for enhanced lighting and cameras mounted on city utilities because they don't have control of, of that area? We have strip mall and mall locations where the shops do not own the parking lot and have no control over that lighting or those security cameras. We have large retailers, how much of the parking lot is required to be under surveillance, cameras on every light post from every angle, facial recognition quality, enhanced lighting with night vision cameras throughout the entire huge acres of, of parking lot possibly. We have video recording equipment that must be locked in a secure container in a locked room that is inaccessible to customers and also being uploaded simultaneously to the cloud or off-site. This requires technology that is not available in the vast areas, geographical areas of the state, and where it might be available, the cost is astronomical to upload speeds, like Todd said, and to store that for massive files that would be produced. Also, the alarm system requiring triplicate alarm systems, wired, wireless, and antiquated voice dial-up systems, all three, it's excessive, redundant, financially burdensome. Firearms are to be inaccessible to customers, ammunition inaccessible to customers, and then on top of that, also stored separately. What does that mean? How far? Across the room and another room? This could require separate storerooms, separate limited access areas, separate safes, and if they both must be inaccessible, why separate? Uh, hundreds of dealers have paid $1,500 license fee, confident that they could meet the letter of the law. Now they find that they can't because of the rules that have been uh, proposed. Rules and regulations by law are supposed to take serious consideration toward the cost and effect of the regulated businesses, but we have proposed rules that good law-abiding dealers who want to offer their merchandise in a legal, safe, and secure manner, but instead are going to be forced to close their doors. Thank you. Thank you. You can take a breath now. <laughs> Okay, number three. My name's Jim Hood, owner operator of Hood's Guns and More. I'm a sole proprietor. Uh, I'd like to dispute the electronic record keeping. That does absolutely nothing to prevent gun crime. All it is is a convenience for ISP to be able to search through our records. There's no reason for it. There's no reason for me to have to pay 80 or 100 bucks a month to make this happen. Under the new rules that you've proposed for the security cameras, you state that I have to have an unobstructed view of everybody's face, both coming in and coming out of my store, and the images must be of sufficient quality for facial recognition. I also need an unobstructed view of the vehicle's license plates that are in my parking lot. I would just like to remind you guys that the politicians are in place right now because our governor wants to save money by doing away with the front license plates. At this point, I have no possible way of putting cameras up on the other side of my parking lot and getting them wired into my current system. I will not be able to comply with that. You also state that I need 90 days of storage both on-site and off-site. I don't understand why on earth it has to be so long. Most of us don't own chain stores and make millions of dollars of profit every year to be able to pay for stuff like this. We're just trying to scratch by and support our families. The current system that I have right now is an eight camera high definition system and it has a two terabyte hard drive. That system loops every seven days. So for simple math, every four cameras you have is going to burn one terabyte of data every week, okay? So with your current rules on where you're telling me I have to place my cameras instead of where I need to place them for my security reasons, I'm gonna have to add four more cameras. So I'm going to have a total of 12 cameras in my little 1,200-foot store, and I'm going to be using three terabytes of data every single week. You're stating that I have to have 90 days of footage, so there's 13 weeks in 90 days, and I'm going to be up to looking at, I have to store 39 terabytes of data. That is way larger than any camera system that comes out. So when you're looking at how am I going to upload this stuff simultaneously, I'm one of the people that I do not have the infrastructure to do that. Currently, I have one wired internet service provider because I built my store on my property in my yard. It is 50 yards from my house. I have a little company called Frontier. When I left this morning to drive up here, my internet was out. And it happens all the time. 
There's nothing I can do about it. Wireless providers will give you 15 gigabytes in a month where a satellite company will give you 50 gigabytes in a month. The requirements that you're putting on me, I'm going to be uploading 12,900 gigabytes in one month. That's over 250 times the allotment of what the satellite companies will give me. There is absolutely no way for me to comply with that, and I've spent about $300,000 of my own money for this store, and I require it for my livelihood. So on January the 2nd of 2021, that'll be the one that shuts me down. Thanks so much for your comments. start with number four. I have one sheet in front of me that has seven names, so I'm going to ask six and seven to come up so we can just keep things rolling, if that's okay. Number six and number seven. Um, and then number four when you're ready. My name is Mandy Sano. I own The Gun Doctor in Roselle, Illinois. Um, a lot of people have been talking about video, which is what I was going to talk about. Um, so I'm going to change my tack. I emailed in, in a copy of the ruling with several, several points highlighted. I do want to say that for my 1,600 square foot store, the quote that I got for the video that did not include the exterior was $10,000. I'm not going to complain about upload or gigabytes. I'm going to tell you that that's what I pay for my children to go to private elementary school. And that's how it affects me. I believe that these regulations, well, we have all these rules and they want to make all these requirements. I suspect, is that the right word? That whoever wrote these laws is not necessarily thinking entirely on how that's gonna prevent gun crime. How is having videos going to stop someone from stealing a car and driving it into my building? I think that these are very, very expensive requirements for people that are barely scraping by with small businesses, and we need to focus on prosecuting so that we can prevent gun crimes. This is not going to assist anybody. This is just going to put good people and families out of business. It's financially onerous. It is, it's an astronomical ask, and it is completely ridiculous to expect items like facial recognition. It, it doesn't it doesn't stop the crimes. And I challenge that it doesn't even really help solve the crimes. Recently, I was in a situation where a vehicle ran into my building, and I know that my department had no use for my video. Where we would have had more success is if we'd have been able to get it prosecuted by the state's attorneys quickly. And I don't need my three minutes, thank you. Number five. How you doing? My name's Roger Crawl from Our Guns Carpentersville. I'm also one of the board members of the Illinois Dealers Association. Uh, cameras seem to be a big, uh, a big to uh, topic on all this regulations. I can tell you that I run 25,000 square feet. I have a conservative estimate of just equipment of $120,000 can easily double depending on how far this regulation finally actually settles out and that's just equipment costs. <clears throat> um, quite frankly, I'd rather spend the money to litigate it against the state, litigate it against the state, than just buy $100,000, $200,000 with the cameras and basically throw the money out the window. I, my, most, my system is already good enough for everything that we need, pictures, all that stuff, and all you're gonna do is get a picture of a guy in a hoodie anyway. Um, <clears throat> The other thing on the 90-day law, all right, um, you know, there's nothing in there that how do we give this information to the state? Is the state going to come in, give us a thumb drive, which I'm not going to put a foreign thumb drive in my computer. Do I give them a thumb drive? They're not going to want to put a foreign thumb drive in the state's computer. I can print them out one picture at a time. It'll take a couple thousand years. Um, I also have three different FFLs. I'm a manufacturer, I'm an importer, and I have a retail store. Essentially, I have the same rules, but three separate rules under ATF regulations. 
So the state rules that are in this, these regulations and even the state law makes it fuzzy as to how you can comply. For an example, as an importer, I can import 500 guns. I can import, I, I've imported guns 10,000 at a time. Sometimes twice that, three times that, four times that. So the, the time allowed to put, it, uh, to put the serial numbers in our books doesn't happen that way. We have other requirements with ATF like markings and stuff like that. So how do you put 10,000 serial numbers, <clears throat> you know, the, the, just, just the manual data putting it in and get it correct isn't going to happen within the time, time that is allowed in the uh, things. Uh, you also have in the regulations inventory every quarter, okay? Well, you know, if you have a smaller store, a couple hundred guns, that's not a big deal. However, the statute says once a year, not four times a year. And the fact that, <clears throat> you know, I can have very large quantities of guns, there's no way. I couldn't finish a quarterly's worth of inventory before I'd have to start it all over again. Um, yeah, it's just insane. And, oh, the other thing I wanted to say, again, on the, uh, the camera system, if I'm going to spend $200,000 or be forced to spend that, I'd rather just spend the money and litigate it with the state. For your comments. Okay, number six when you're ready. My name's Dan Eldridge. I'm the owner of Max and Shooter Supplies in Des Plaines and president of the Dealers Association. Uh, 2019 started off poorly for the Department of Illinois State Police. You lost three troopers to, to tragic traffic accidents. You had the Aurora mass murder, which was a cascading law enforcement and judicial system failure. And of course, you had leadership changes in Springfield. Getting gun dealer license rulemaking dumped on your laps was probably not the, at the top of your favorite to-do list. I understand. But no tragedies, no workload, no organizational changes can excuse the broken process that gun dealer licensing rulemaking is, nor the profoundly flawed work product that you have produced. In no other Illinois licensure regime have the licensees been excluded from the process. Barbers, dog groomers, doctors, lawyers, whatever. Industry sits on the boards and helps make the rules because they, are under, they understand how the businesses operate and because there's a presumption that they're honorable citizens and business people. Not so here. With the signage, video surveillance, employee rosters, and on and on, it appears to me that gun dealers, their employees, and their customers are being stigmatized and otherized. Yet we're among the lowest crime cohort in the adult society. Why? The Dealer Association, FFLIL, for which I serve as president, offered our domain expertise and technical expertise in reviewing the rules before publication. After two phone calls with the ISP leadership to discuss the broken application process, no further input from us was solicited. And the rules you published are the predictable outcome of the department's exclusion of those who understand the business from the process. I'm a mid-sized dealer. Our organization includes dealers, large and small, manufacturers, distributors, gunsmiths, even collectors. Whoever wrote these rules evidently has never operated, let alone been in a gun shop, manufacturer, or gunsmith. What they came up with fails in three major areas. Number one, it exceeds the rulemaking authority under the Act. Number two, it's technically or economically unfeasible. Number three, it conflicts with existing law and the Illinois and U.S. constitutions. You've received our line-by-line -line commentary, so I won't waste what remains of my three minutes with that. What I will say is this. These are not barbershops or dog groomers or even lawyers and their customers. These are businesses that support a fundamental, natural, constitutional right to keep and bear arms and lawfully justified self-defense. These rules and the Gun Dealer Licensing Act attack the free exercise of these rights as written, can be interpreted only as attempting to snuff out every remaining FFL in Illinois. They will not likely survive judicial scrutiny. I, I don't relish another court battle. I'm already six years into the Cook County gun and ammo tax litigation, and the least worst outcome here is to bring these rules into alignment with how lawful businesses and law-abiding citizens operate. The association stands ready to both offer technical domain expertise as well as to be a fierce, litigious protector of Illinois citizens' gun rights and our businesses. Thank you. Okay, number seven, when you're ready. Hello, my name's Chris Tupper. I'm an FFL dealer in a rural community in Southern Illinois with a population of only 1,666 people. I'll tell you right now, the one main concern that I had Evidently, it's the same thing that everyone else, no matter what the size of their shop is. The cost of implementing these rules will close my doors. 
There's no doubt about it. It, it's, it was completely unexpected when these rules come out, according to what the, the, the information that was put out to us to pay your $1,500 fees to begin with. I fully thought I had everything under control and the amount of video equipment, electronic surveillance. I've never had any guns sold or, or traced back to me that was any kind of a crime in, ever produced in any kind of a crime whatsoever. I'm in a rural area. I know everybody that comes in. The 24-7 video that's required just makes the, it, it's completely ridiculous because it's 24-7 monitoring and not just motion activated. That is one of the things that makes the amount of data just skyrocket. And the cost of transferring, transmitting any of that data is just unbelievable. Everybody's went over all the same things that I've got, and so I'm not going to go beating the same thing, but I will tell you, it's absolutely not available in my area. I have no access to internet or capabilities that would transfer this amount of data. I have done some research into what the cost would be if it was available. It's unbelievable, we won't even go there. The redundancy of the alarm system. I've got an alarm system that covers everything that I ever, ever would need. I felt, but then the rules come out and say now I've got to have three times that, all on individual, all on separate systems. When I'm going to be the first one shows up, if my alarm goes off, I can guarantee you that. I'm in a town of 1,600 people. I'm about 17 miles from the courthouse and the sheriff's office. I'm 80 miles from the state police post. Who's going to be the first one? But none of the alarm systems going to do a bit of good. Because they're going to notify me as well. And I'll be the first one there. I'm two blocks away. I invested a life savings in trying to make this gun business work. And then these rules come along and knock the feet completely out from under me. And I feel like that, I don't, put, don't direct this toward the ISP because I know you guys are the ones being forced to, in, to write and enforce these rules. But this Gun Dealer Licensing Act to begin with, that was the purpose of it, is to close our doors. We're going to take a couple, sorry. We're going to take another break for a couple minutes so we can get um, our next round of speakers uh, teed up and ready to go. Before we do that, I just want to commend all of our speakers, one through seven, for being so prepared and so specific in your commentary. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone here for being so respectful and courteous. This process is going so smoothly and we really appreciate all of your cooperation and all the time and effort that you clearly spent before coming here today to make sure that you can give us feedback that is useful to us. So thank you very much for that. We'll break for five minutes and then we'll continue with additional speakers. I think we're about ready to get started. Um, we have six more people who have signed up to speak. So I'm going to ask numbers 10 through 15 to uh, come up and we can start with number 10. Smith. I'm pro-gun and indoor range mayor in Illinois. Uh, the video thing, I did do some checking on it. It cost me $25,000 to be able to accommodate part of what you want. It was to part basically just for the video, not to upload it to the web, which most of them down there in our area have not figured out how to do that yet with that much data, you know, and stuff. So I just want to let you know it's still in very expensive and along with the $1,500 that we've already paid, you know, stuff, uh, 
another item I, is so that you're one gun per person to hand out. Basically, you want to lock it up and wait till the next person comes in and grab another gun, right? Okay. That means one person per gun per, in, per customer. I can wait on two or three at the same time. When those other two or three customers come in, they're not going to stand around and wait for one guy to sit there for 30 minutes to figure out whether or not he's going to want a gun and stuff. So you're sitting there waiting. You're waiting patiently, like I am doing now, and you're sitting there going, you know, please hurry up and make a decision. I've got five other people that want to buy a gun. It's going to be almost impossible to do. I understand. I understand locking them up maybe is okay, but to be able to sit there and get every one of them out and stand there and wait for them to put them back up is going to be impossible. The other thing I want to let you know is Illinois is different. Uh, we are a long, slender state. Everybody in our area and stuff, I mean, if they wanted to buy guns, of course, they just go out of the state and buy guns, you know, and stuff. So the rules and regulations that you guys are putting on us makes more of those guys go out and buy those guns and stuff. And that's what they're doing now. They will continue to do it, just like drugs or anything else. They're going out this and doing it, whether we like it or not, and stuff. It's just a human factor that's built into this system and stuff. Uh, mainly it's just very expensive overall and stuff. Um, I've, I've been doing a lot of the regulations down in our area and trying to get it all to work out. Uh, the 90-day system on the camera, again, $25,000. It's a lot to be able to do. I'm a, I do have one employee and stuff, so I am paying that and stuff. But for me to make up $25,000 just to give back to, the, to a camera company to come in and do that, it's all, I mean, how long is it going to take me to make that many guns? When we sell a gun and stuff, it's usually to an individual, you know, and stuff that walks in, he's got the FOID card and stuff, and he's, we ask to see if we can see his FOID card, you know, basically to buy the gun. And so he's standing there and he's waiting and waiting and waiting. That guy's rights have been violated, uh, to my, the way I look at it, because he's standing there looking for a gun that should be a second amendment of, I mean, we all have the right to bear arms and stuff. Doesn't matter which arm it is, we all, we, we all have the right to bear arms. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, number 11. Okay, my name is John Tucker, JV's Guns and Ammo. I run a small business out of my home, well, out of my garage, which is attached to my home. I have run that business for 33 years. I'm open from two in the afternoon until five of the evening, five days a week. All the requirements here, especially the security systems for the parking lots and things like that, the city will not let me change my parking other than my driveway. I cannot add any additional parking so people park in the street. Uh, I can't change the looks of my house. I can't advertise. I mean, I don't advertise. No signs out. If someone comes to my house that I don't know, when they walk in, I ask them, how did you find out about me? And, you know, what is your name and how did you find out about me? Since I do not advertise and don't have any signs, it's strictly word of mouth. And the cost of all this system is more than I would ever be able to pay for. And uh, as far as the alarm system, the alarm that I have on my entrance door to my shop is run by the ADT from my home. So the system I have in my home also runs that shop. Apparently, I will have to have a second system to run that and more additional cost. As a matter of fact, I had two customers yesterday, sold a total of $25 worth of stuff. So I can't afford a lot of this stuff. And as far as the alarm system, well, I, well, I do have security cameras, but the alarm system I have is only with ADT. Uh, and window glass breakage, I have one window. The sides are about 16 inches wide. I have bars across it horizontally and vertical. The most 
opening that you can get through is like an eight by 10 opening. So I don't expect people to crawl in through there. Uh, glass breakage, since I have plexiglass on the inside and the windows are so small, I don't see why I would have to have security on that window, you know, as far as glass breakage. Uh, well, additional alarm system or security, I guess, is the way my house is made and that one part of my garage, the door is only 10 feet from my bedroom, my window. And I cannot get into my door to my shop without going through my house first. I have a security door that has a rod that goes into the walls. I have a solid fiberglass, okay, and then bars on the inside. Thank you. Number 12. Good afternoon. My name is Todd Reichert, and I am here today um, I was requested to review the rules, uh, proposed rules, by the Gun Violence Education and Prevention Center, uh, the GPEC. I am a 30 plus year law enforcement and, uh, veteran. I started my career as a police officer in Carrollton, Texas in 1985. Left Carrollton when I was hired as a special agent for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives in 1990. I spent my entire street career working firearms trafficking between the Chicago Firearms Trafficking Unit downtown and uh, in Maryville, Indiana, working primarily intra and interstate firearms trafficking cases. Um, I then supervised gang group in Downers Grove, uh, Aurora, and Rockford, and uh, have retired out of ATF as assistant special agent in charge in uh, Houston Field Division. Uh, in looking at the uh, the proposed rules and that, yeah, I'm in support of the rules that uh, ISP has put forward. Uh, in a couple areas of consideration that I might offer uh, is in reference to the inspection, um, basically the inspections, the one year, one a year requirement, as well as the, um, the ability for any law enforcement to follow up on uh, investigations pertaining to firearms that have been recovered in crime, so forth and so on. I would just offer up that perhaps a more of a delineation to ensure that there's no confusion that an officer coming in to follow up on a trace is not considered an inspection, number one. And number two, that with that one year um, requirement that while ISP has or is proposing this uh, inspection requirement. There are also inspection requirements of other agents to, you know, include ATF that they too have a one year and that one should not have a force or effect on the other. Um, overall, um, I commend the Illinois State Police for holding this type of forum, this type of hearing to hear the comments from the industry. I think that these rules and these procedures going forward will enable ISP to both, both effectively regulate the firearms industry within the state of Illinois and as well work and uh, develop partnerships with the industry as you go forward. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. I lost count. I think I'm on 13. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Stephen King. I'm from the St. Louis metro area. I have two stores in that area. Uh, one is in Belleville, Illinois. It's been there for 50 years or so. Uh, we have a very big business. We do a very good job down there. We sell thousands of guns. Uh, but we also take our job very responsible. As a former law enforcement officer, I've spent many years fighting crime and making sure that illegal people are off the street and that illegal firearms are off the street. As a firearms dealer for the last 16 years, I have made it my life goal to sell guns to legal citizens who have that right to purchase their firearms. We've issued thousands of FOIA cards or helped people get thousands of FOIA cards. And in the past five years, we have gotten a lot of people getting their concealed carry license. I want to commend the state police for their job on the concealed carry license. They did a very fine job putting a big monster into a little box. And I, I think that we had some heartache at the very beginning, but it worked out well. What I'm here to say is I agree with most of the people that are talking today. There is a lot of burden with these rules and regulations. It is very clear from the very beginning that these rules are written by people who know nothing about the firearm industry. 
I am very taken aback that they did not request a civilian review board or a dealer inquiry board to come out and help them write things and help them understand what we go through. If you came to my store today and inspected my store, I would probably pass the majority of these rules. My camera system is very elaborate, but just to get the storage database, I have to spend another $40,000 just to get the hard drives, the hardware, to make that happen, much less the cloud base and the 90 days and all this other stuff. I think that the Illinois State Police are treating the dealers as criminals and dealers as the people that are facilitating the criminals. When you look at every one of these people in this room that are making this their livelihood, there isn't one person in this room, I am sure, that is taking this opportunity and, and the name of a federally licensed firearms dealer for granted, and they're not selling knowingly to, fire, to people who are prohibited from buying firearms. When we look at these rules, there are more regulations against us who we are already regulated by the federal government and in many cases state and local government, but we have more regulations than this pot growing industry that's going on, than the barber business or the stripper club business or the alcohol business or the liquor store business. There are far more regulations being put onto us than any of these other industries that are deemed just as illegal or, or horrible by the media that we are. And as I said before, there's a many, many good people in this room that do this for a living. Myself is one of them. And we want to work with the state police. And we want to work with trying to make this where we can make it where we can all live together with it. We do not want illegal firearms on the road. But having camera systems that watch license plates on a busy thoroughfare, it's just it's absurd. And we don't have that technology for facial recognition. Well, little hoodies and, and baseball caps can cover just about everything. So please come to us before you make the final rules and get some dealers, some of the bigger dealers in the state, some of those small dealers in rural areas, and, and pull a combination of different aspects before you write one-size-fits-all legislation. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your comments. Okay, number 14. 14. Hello, my name is Brian McNichols. I'm the owner of MMI Guns out of Manuka, Illinois. Uh, my views and my comments today are going to stress and, and add on to what most of those individuals have said so far this, this afternoon. One of the biggest things that, that they're hitting on right now are the camera systems and the storage, which I agree it, is it, it's mundane to have 90 days of storage. With the amount of, with the cost would go into our shops to have that storage is ridiculous. I don't know of any other industry in the nation that has that much storage required upon them by an acting law. So to require that upon us, and as the last gentleman said, the requirements that you're trying to put on us are beyond those of other newer industries that are now coming into the state. We've been here for years, 200 years, and the requirements you're putting on us are way above and beyond what, what those other industries are just now starting out to do. And the, the fact you're putting it on the dealers, again, like the last gentleman said, you're making us look like the criminals. Trey Perkwinkle said about a year and a half, two years ago, she made a comment, why punish many for the acts of few. Terry Preckwinkle said that. Her response was to a carjacking and they want to raise the, the, re, or the, the standards or the, the charging for carjacking. But her statement right there, I laughed when I heard it because it affects us in the same way. All right? I don't know of a dealer in this room that has sold an illegal gun. Anybody want to raise your hand? No. I haven't either and I've been doing this for 20 years. I've worked at four different shops. I finally was able to open up my own shop five years ago. Now, at the beginning, you asked us to, to tell you how it directly affects us, our friends and our family. I'm a small shop. I'm a brick and mortar. I employ myself and two other individuals. Those individuals with the cost that you want to incur on us are going to have to go to the wayside, and I'm going to have to try and run the shop on my own, doing all the paperwork that you require of us, maintaining all the other regulations within, this, within the rules that you're proposing, and maintain my client base. That's going to be almost impossible, if not impossible, for me to do as a small shop owner. I closed my shop today to come down here to voice my opinion to you. So there's a loss of my income, but this is an important part of me if I want to keep my business alive. Affecting my family, it's taking food out of my family's mouth. I'm the, I, I try to be the biggest proprietor of my own shop. I want to take home my money so I can pay my family. I, I send my kids to good school. My wife says, hey, we need food or we want to do this, we want to go on vacation. I want to be able to have that money afforded to them. It's very difficult for me when I have to go out and spend ten thousand, twenty thousand to upgrade my camera system. That seems to be the biggest thing, and so affecting 
me, my family, my friends, that is how it is going to directly affect us, the cost that you're incurring on the small mom pop shop. We cannot do this. We simply cannot. One other thing I'd like to hit up in the last 30 seconds, thank you, ma'am. When it comes to the storage proposals, ammunition, firearms separate, in my shop, you walk in, we have long guns along the wall, we have ammunition underneath long guns, and those are both behind a glass display cabinet, which have our handguns. The ammunition that we have out available for the public just to touch and grab are shotgun shells. There's no guns that are out on our floor that a client can access. And like one of the other gentlemen said, the client that's coming in anyways, I'd say seven out of 10 of our clients coming in are already concealed carry licensees holders, so they already have armed firearms with them, and I'm not afraid of that. Thank you again for having us speak this afternoon. I appreciate my time. Thank you. Number 15. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jim Fegans. Uh, well, I own Jay Good Shooting Sports Capital Firearms Academy. I'm also uh, an advanced law enforcement rapid response training instructor for Texas State University. I teach active shooter situations to police departments all over the country. I also do the uh, active shooter incident management. But I do that for free. I uh, make my living with my firearm store. Um, I, when this bill was proposed under the, uh, the adamant of the uh, straw purchases, I, like everybody else, threw my little tissy fit based on the proposals that we saw at the time, paid my $1,500. I have security systems in place, alarm system, um, and then I see the proposals as they get ready to go to JCAR. That's going to put me out of business. Uh, my firearm store, like a young lady earlier, uh, was broken into a couple years ago, drove a car through my wall. My firearms are secured in safes at night. Uh, we have a gunsmithing business. They got away with four guns that were in stages of repair. They caught them within 30 minutes, or an hour and 30 minutes from uh, the break-in. They charged them with illegal transportation and unlawful possession of a weapon. We have no uh, federal uh, gun trafficking laws in this country. The state of Illinois does have trafficking, but they refuse to uh, pr prosecute these people for that. These guys are gonna be out in another year to do it again. So I lift up to you, uh, I think the U.S. Attorney's uh, Office under the ATF uh, uh, information. There was 112,000 people in 2017 that were flagged by us dealers or reported to ATF as trying to make a straw purchase. Out of the 112,000 in 2017, 20 of them were actually investigated and only one person was charged with that. Um, and this, with my alarm system and security I have now, I'm looking at about 15 to 20,000 come January and I just, that's not affordable for me. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, I believe that everyone who registered to speak has had an opportunity. Uh, is there anyone who did put their name down that we missed? Anybody? Okay. We're going to take another break. We do have more time. So our thought was that if there's anyone who has not registered to speak at this time and would like an opportunity to do that, You'll have an opportunity now within the next five minutes of our break to go back and uh, request a number so you have an opportunity to speak. I know that a few individuals, when they first came in, indicated that they did not believe that three minutes was going to be enough time for them. Because we have additional time right now, if you've had your three minutes and you have something different that you would like to share that you, you cut out of your initial three minutes um, to be mindful of your time, you can put your name on that list and get another number as well. Um, again, I would like to thank all of you who spoke today. Um, first of all, you are all very mindful of your time, so thank you for that. Um, and your commentary was very thoughtful, and I know that it's going to be very helpful to us as we continue through this process. So uh, we really do appreciate it. Let's take five minutes and we can regroup uh, after that. Thank you. All right, we're, our five minutes is up. We're going to reconvene. I actually don't have a list, so, oh, it's coming. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> One second. Okay, so we have numbers 16 through 20, if you want to come up to speak. Before we get started, I just want to remind everybody, same rules apply. You get your three minutes. Uh, we'll hold up the 30-second warning and then the red card when your time is up. 
And with that, we can start with number 16. Jim Hood from Hood's Guns and More. Uh, I just wanted to, there was part of it I left out earlier about whenever I look through the rules and I read and it states that any peace officer, which I think the gentleman was alluding to earlier, but you state that any peace officer who is required to carry a firearm in order to conduct their duties can come in my store and demand to see my records. Now we all know firearms are not like HIPAA, but people take their firearms seriously. My customers don't want some Joe Blow guy who, who knows, he, he can work in a small town 400 miles away. He has no business looking at any of my records. All he is doing is wasting my time. I have no employees. It is not by choice, it's because financially I can't afford to pay an employee. My shop is open six days a week, 10 hours a day, that's me. It's not by choice, the money is not there. Probably not the best financial situation that I've ever been in in my life, definitely not the best financial move I've ever made. But what I can tell you is, I was a coal miner of 24 years and I lost my job due to politicians' war on coal. I made a very good living in what I did and I'm in the process of raising my children. Whenever I built this store, I built it with my own money. There's no loans. I used the money that I should have used for my retirement. If I hadn't have done this by now, we probably would have been like a lot of other people and already left this state. But now that I've dumped the money in it, I'm between a rock and a hard place. I have to try and make this work. I mean, everything that I've heard everybody complain about today, it's all the same crap we're all going through. And it seems like we're willing to work with you guys. And the bill that was signed into law states that Illinois State Police will create the rules. And you guys have done that. It also states that Illinois State Police will set the fees. And you maxed it out 100%. It's exactly what you've done to the rules. And it seems an awful lot to most of us that it's the politicians that are writing the rules. Because we all know, nobody said it yet, but what wants to happen, our politicians don't want gun stores in this state at all. And that's the cold, hard truth. We know that. We live in southern Illinois where hunting is a way of life. So like I said, we're willing to work with you guys. All we ask for is for you guys to be respectful and work with us. Pretend like you're spending your own money out of your checking account, not taxpayers' dollars and not corporations' dollars. Thank you. Number 17. The one thing that I did leave out earlier, and it seems as though most everybody has admitted to the fact that the vagueness of what is written in these rules when it comes to minimum requirements on your safe storage plans, all of your day-to-day your -day business handlings, are, it, it alludes to maybe you got to do it this way, but there's no, nothing cut and dried to give a person minimum guidelines on how we're supposed to do ammunition storage. You think, well, it can't be where the guns are, but it really never does say you've got to be separated, you've got to have so many feet. The customer can't access both. It alludes to that fact, but nowhere is it ever cut and dried that that's the way it is. An awful lot of things about the rules are that way. In fact, it even says in a few places that these will be up to interpretation at the time, up to the officer making the inspection. How can you know whether or not you're going to meet the regulations if you don't know what the minimum guidelines are? A lot of the things about the bills proposed, the proposed rules are that way. Uh, the, back to the cameras, the facial recognition, that's not a description of a camera. An eight megapixel camera, that's a description of a camera. Facial recognition does not tell me what camera system I've got to have. You're still guessing. The entire rule system is based on reference. 
and it will be left up to the person making the judgment call at the time. It's impossible for a person, especially operating on the shoestring budget that a shop like myself is, to even know whether you want to move forward when you look at the fact that we paid the, fi the fees to begin with and then we get the camera, you know, get all these others on top of it that we wasn't expecting. Now, okay, I think I'm going to pay these fees and I do all of this, meet all these requirements, or I think I meet them, and then my inspection comes up and something doesn't qualify. I'm out tens of thousands of dollars just because someone doesn't agree with what's the minimum requirements. You've got to have them in black and white. Okay, we have number 18. Thanks. Uh, again, Dan Elders from Action Shooter Supplies. Uh, I'd like to take a different cut at uh, the camera systems and building on what the, the previous gentleman just said. Biometric Information Protection Act of Illinois requires affirmative consent before you collect biometric data, fingerprints, facial recognition, anything that's biometric identifying data, you need affirmative written consent. Number of companies have been sued and lost. Great America sued and lost for the fingerprint swipe of a 14-year-old boy. I think you are not using the term facial recognition in the way that it exists in the law, in the BIPA law, because we cannot comply. You're putting us in conflict with existing law by requiring cameras that have facial recognition. Number two, what is the purpose of storing data? When we get a law enforcement inquiry and we provide them with a thumb drive of, of, uh, of video recording, it's typically five minutes before the event, five minutes after. That's what they care about. A different application that would require 24-7, uh, 365 days a year would be something like a hospital that is trying to camera up so that they can prove they didn't do anything wrong. Central DuPage Hospital has 620 cameras in it. They have, they have three seven-foot-tall racks of servers to store this data for 30 days so that in the event that they are sued, they can go back and pull the events that happened. Who was in the room? What did they do? How do they store that much data with 620 cameras? They've dialed the frame rate back to seven and a half frames per second, so it looks like a herky-jerky old-time black and white movie. Okay, but that's for a different purpose. They can't have cameras that go dark when no one's in the room because, of course, it goes to court and somebody says, well, the camera's blank for this hour. Who was in the room? So they have to constantly record. There's absolutely no law enforcement or investigative value to me to record an empty room, an empty store, an empty shooting range overnight when nobody is there. Again, the association stands ready to try to help the Illinois State Police produce a rule set that we can comply with. I, I, I understand everyone wants to get this thing done and we're ready to help, but we need to be invited into the room. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, number 19. Three minutes doesn't cover it. Let me tell you what's wrong with the, with the regulations you have. My yellow highlighter ran out of ink. And that's just my notes in here, okay? You're, you're, what, what the legislators decided to do and dump it into the state police's lab is create a miniature ATF on a state level, okay? ATF with a billion dollars a year budget still can't get things right. It happens all the time. They lose in court. They counteract their own rules, regulations, everything else, and the rules and regulations are like this big. Um, we all understand that we've got the law. We have to abide by it. Same thing for the regulations. The problem is, is the language you're using in this is not the same type of language we're used to dealing with ATF. So it's like literally le learning another, it's like learning Spanish from English. So, <clears throat> 
you know, you're, you're trying to put all these rules and regulations on, I don't know, 20 some odd pages here, and you're gonna find out a lot of this is gonna be contested if, if you have a dealer in, in, in violation, you're gonna start seeing the definition of is, is. For an example, you have one section here that says calendar days. There's another, another sentence in here that says days. Now, when you get your FOID card, it used to be, well, that's business days. So we didn't include, you know, Martin Luther King, Christmas Day, all that other stuff, even though the law says days. Um, so if, you know, if the regulations are gonna come out should talk to us in the industry, we can actually help you write it so that A, it can, it, we can get to the, the finish line the same way, but so that everybody can understand it and that it's practical to make it happen. That's it. Okay, last but not least, number 20. Todd Vanderbilt on behalf of FFL Illinois again. A couple of things. What the rules don't address is they don't address what do you do if you're a licensee with multiple licenses. I've had multiple licenses at my location. Roger carries an 01, which is your typical retail type license. Roger carries an 07, which is a manufacturer's license because he manufactures his own line of guns. He carries an 08 license, which is an importer. He imports thousands of firearms. What do you do when you have a multiple, and he's not the only guy like that. What happens when you have the retail side of the store and does everything that affects the retail license then fall over and apply to the 07 and the 08 as well? You know, when you talk about the 24 hour rule about logging stuff in, you have Xander's, a major distributor in Southern Illinois. They probably take in freight trucks full of firearms in a day. They have to be licensed under this act. There's no way to log in, as Roger said, thousands of firearms. Think about the manufacturing process. You take a lower receiver that came from the machine shop, you have to log it in. You take those same 5,000 receivers and now send them out to a plater to be anodized. They have to be logged out. And then when they come back from the plater, those same 5,000 receivers get logged back into your books again. This is where, you know, it, it, how are you going to treat a licensee that has multiple licenses like that? Does he have to video his entire warehouse operation or only the retail operation? Uh, you talk about inspections. You guys don't define what qualifies as an inspection. You say there's one unannounced inspection a year. Great. So if my local PD comes in and does that, then okay, Todd, we're here to inspect you. Great. Here's my books. Now, do I get to send you a notice and say, guess what? You're precluded from coming to my shop unannounced for a year because I've already had my one inspection. It's unclear how this all works. You use talk about you can do multiple for good cause. Good cause is defined nowhere in the statute or in the rules. What's good cause? How do you initiate a complaint? Do we have a bunch of anti-gunners that don't like certain gun shops in this state simply start filing anonymous complaints like the gangbangers try to do against CPD officers? And is that enough to warrant an unannounced inspection or any inspection on behalf? You guys are putting a rock in a hard place. We as the industry are more than willing to stop. We asked ahead of time to be involved. We still want to be involved so we can get you a set of rules that we understand because as been mentioned before, we're used to dealing with, you know, ATF's language and how they define things. We've had problems simply getting a simple answer out of the state police for the last two years. Are shockwaves legal in the state of Illinois? And all we get told when we've been to the ISP seminars with ATF is that, well, if you call it in, you'll get an FTIP approval. We'd like to work with you guys. Just pick up the phone and talk to us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I think that concludes the public uh, comment period. And at this point, we're gonna wrap up. Um, I'm gonna defer to the major for the moment. Again, we just wanna thank you for your time, for coming out. We appreciate the feedback. As Yvette said, you know, thank you for uh, being respectful of each other and your time. Uh, we do value your feedback and comments, and we will uh, take it back and consider it 
as we continue to review the rules. So thank you again for your time. I want to thank you all as well. Um, you made my job incredibly easy. So I very much appreciate that. Um, and on behalf of ISP, uh, we do appreciate your feedback. We were glad to see so many people here today to give it to us. And on a personal level, I just want to say that I'm so impressed that so many people took time out of their day to come here today. And as I said before, your comments were so well prepared and so thoughtful. I know that I learned a lot today, so thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate it. And with that, um, we conclude the public forum. Thank you.